Hi everybody, welcome back to this special CUBE presentation here at RSA, RSAC 2024. We're inside of Moscone West, this is day four, and we're going to talk about a very important topic that really is starting to take shape in the industry and as it relates to public policy, because not all organizations share the same sort of standards on reporting and transparency when it comes to breaches. And so, we sometimes don't hear about it until way after the fact that we read about it in the news. Other companies actually disclose up front, so there really aren't any great standards to go by, so that creates confusion in the marketplace. So, I'm Dave Vellante, along with my co-host, Zias Caravalla of ZK Research, and we're really excited to have Jim Richberg here. He is the head of cyber policy and the global field CISO at Fortinet, and Suzanne Spaulding is the former undersecretary, Department of Homeland Security, and she's part of the Fortinet Advisory Council. Folks, welcome to theCUBE, welcome to this panel. Thanks so much for taking some time with us. Thank you, Thanks. great to be here. You guys just came off another panel called No More Secrets. Suzanne, this is something that you coined in 2010. Okay, so pretty prescient. Uh, I'd like you to start, each of you, Suzanne, you could start. Introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and why you're so passionate about this topic. Yeah, well Dave, first of all, uh, great to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, so, yeah, I, I wrote this blog in 2010 uh, called No More Secrets uh, with the, un, you know, trying to raise awareness that the shelf life of secrets was vanishingly short. And the idea that you could somehow have a monopoly on information, including the discovery of a vulnerability for any length of time, and that others weren't going to discover that information, or that you could keep information secret for any length of time was really increasingly a myth, and that we needed to learn how to operate in that environment. So the idea is, you know, we all know that if you train to fight in the dark, you could meet your adversary at night or you could turn off the light and you'd have the advantage, right? Think about the daredevil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what we have is a transparent world that's coming at us full steam ahead, where lights are being turned on all over the world. And, and the darkness that, uh, that allows you to keep secrets is, va is vanishing, is going away. So we need to train to fight in the light. And whoever can learn to operate with a level of radical transparency is going to have the advantage in the world that's coming at us. Great, thank you for that. So Jim, I think radical transparency is something that is uh, near and dear to your heart. Tell us about your background and, and what's your premise on this topic? So Dave, I came to Fortinet after a full career in the federal government. Suzanne and I were longtime colleagues on cybersecurity. I mean, I was doing it before we called it cybersecurity. And from my perspective, the biggest problem in cybersecurity is not people, process, or technology. It was metrics. It's the fact that we lack bad data. Is the incidence of ransomware X 2x or 3x. We're really guessing, we're throwing darts at a dartboard. The same thing applies on defense. Uh, what is the prevalence of a given class of vulnerability? Is it getting better or worse over time? So radical transparency is a way of saying, we're going to have to enable people to make informed decisions as consumers and uh, frankly as policy issues. And this week, CISA released the Secure by Design pledge that 68 vendors signed. I was one of the leads from the IT sector in negotiating, collaborating with CISA to evolve that pledge. And one of the items is, uh, several of the items are about vulnerability, but one says you really should be disclosing the vulnerabilities yeah. that you discover. The baseline is if it's critical or high, or if someone's exploiting it, but we'd like to see you go further. So this is all, Dave, about saying, look, the market works best when information flows. And in cybersecurity, we've had too much opacity about issues like vulnerability. And we have, you know, we have history on disclosure. I go back decades to the Tylenol situation, and, and it became, you know, a, a, a PR case study. But it really hasn't trickled in to the technology industry generally, in the, in the cybersecurity industry specifically, and that's really what you guys are trying to create some standards around, isn't it? Yeah, and it's really important because when I was undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security and I had the great honor of leading the men and women who worry about strengthening the security and resilience of our critical infrastructure that we depend upon every single day, um, all day, every day, um, 
And I would go around and talk to companies about the importance of disclosure. And of course, this was before we had the, the mandated incident disclosure that finally came. Uh, and they would say, look, we can't disclose because our competitors aren't disclosing. And therefore, it, we look like we're the only ones this is happening to, and it's, it puts us at a competitive disadvantage. And our, our competitors are going to use this against us, right? And, and so we, we evolved to the point where we said, you know, this, there's not enough market incentive to, to, to disclose breaches. We have to require that. And because we need that information to get better. We all need to be sharing information and, and increasing our understanding so that we can all progress. Vulnerability disclosure is much the same. Um, you know, it's really important to disclose that information, both to protect your customers so that they can take action on it quickly, but also again to enhance the marketplace and enhance all of our understanding. The worry is that people will say, oh, you're disclosing an awful lot of vulnerabilities, you must be insecure. Right. And the reality yeah. is, until we figure out how to have 100% safe code writing, and 100% secure products and services, everyone is going to have vulnerabilities, and that's where we are today. Everyone has vulnerabilities, and what distinguishes them is, are you hearing about the vulnerability from your vendor, or are they burying it a few weeks down the road in a general update with lots of new features, et cetera, um, that's the difference. I, I don't actually think we'll ever get to a world where we have no, no. zero, right? No. And, and, and the, the hard part for buyers on this is it is confusing, and um, I, I think the media, in some ways, uh, treats companies that report vulnerabilities unfairly because they take these things and they blow them up. And there's a lot of factors from a buyer standpoint where you have to look at is how broad is the product line? You know, how many product? You know, do they have? How deep do you go? Um, you know, how many versions back are you supporting? And then so, a company like Fortinet, you know, Cisco, Palo Alto, you're going to have more than a point product company just by the very nature of what you do. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so you can look at it as a bad thing. I recently wrote a Forbes post where I talked about it and I said, yeah. it's a good thing to report vulnerabilities because yeah. yeah. customers do need to know and as to your point, it's about transparency and so you can't fix what you don't know and it's a, it is a fact of life and uh, the, the most important thing is you need to do what's right for the customer, yeah. and I think the, the, the steps you've taken with Secure by Design is the right thing for the customer. I mean, put yourself in the customer's yeah. shoes. Flaws exist, someone's going to find them. Yeah. Who would you rather find them? The manufacturer or a third party researcher who tells the manufacturer and gives them time to fix it, or an adversary? Yeah. That's the worst case, is you only find out after the bad thing has happened. So, you know, the reality is in an imperfect world where people try to do better, but, but perfection is yeah. not in the And that the is one thing we'll to look it. at, too, as yeah. piece of advice is, what percent of the vulnerabilities are actually discovered by the company, right? Because if it's a high percentage externally, that yep. means the, the, the vendor's not actually looking for them. Right, and, and uh, but, well, but it's, it's an imperfect science today though. And yeah. there's so many examples yeah. in the physical world, I think about automobile manufacturers and, and recalls. Yeah. It's, but it's just, it still hasn't translated over into the, to the digital world, but this is a bipartisan issue. I mean, it's not, people are, hopefully aren't disagreeing on this, but I think sometimes the industry, as you say, they're very nervous, they sometimes think the government is finger wagging, so how do you, how do you address that perception that immediately gets the industry to be defensive? I mean, obviously these, this initiative is designed to do so. I wonder if you could talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, uh, this is, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, uh, this is the road that CISA navigates, that we had to navigate. Um, you, you need the trust and cooperation of industry in order to be able to make advance, advances here. And the Secure by Design pledge, I think is a, just a terrific example of how you can navigate uh, that challenge. This was, you know, arrived at in consultation, full consultation with the private sector on what is reasonable, what is doable, you know, what, what should our expectations be. I think they pushed, you know, CISA pushed hard to make that as robust as possible, but it's still voluntary, but companies have signed up by name. It gives a standard that technology analysts, for example, can write about you know this product has signed the pledge, has provided transparency. Here's how they their processes um, meet the pledge and are secure. So I think providing that level of transparency 
is a way of making the marketplace work and not having yet to resort to regulation and mandates. And, and, and to build on that point, when we were collaborating on building this, we said, don't tell us what to do and how to do it. Let's agree on common goals. Leave it to each company to figure out, because to your point, different companies, different sizes, different foci yeah. in the market. We'll each figure out how to do it and how to measure. That was the other important point. You're not just signing a one and done pledge. You're supposed to report how you have done publicly on implementation. You and, and the pledge has got straightforward goals, and then there's typically an expansion, what does this mean, why is this important, some examples of implementation, and some examples of how you might report on it, but I'll underscore their examples. They're not telling any company that signed the pledge, you have to do it this way. That's well, also an important way of making sure that it is relevant for a longer period of time, as the dynamics yeah. of the threat and response. This is super important, because frankly, the technology industry has been very poor at self-regulation. Uh, and so, because you're now fighting in the light and you have standards that analysts can actually evaluate objectively organizations on, that creates kind of a peer, it's like a locker room in football where the veterans are you know, teaching the, the rookies and, and, and there's a culture that permeates. And, and that really is what you're trying to affect. It won't happen overnight, but over a course of, of I, years. Well, and I think really the standardization is huge too because uh, you know, if you're a, startup and you're coming to market, you may take some shortcuts and not do secure passwords or, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things if you follow the standards, secure by design isn't just a tagline, it actually is, you're building security into design and hopefully for, uh, you know, other vendors that maybe didn't follow those best practices, their level of, um, uh, you know, just quality of product goes up because they do follow best practices set forth by companies that have been doing it a long time. Well, we felt that, it, that in, in creating this pledge, we needed it to have immediate impact. So yes, we'll focus on things like mitigate persistent classes of vulnerability like SQL injection, but you know, if the failure to change passwords from install, the failure to use MFA, the failure to apply security patches are over and over again implicated as the top causes of breach, you got to hit those head on. You have to say, these are unacceptable, and those are pretty binary. It's like, reduce this, eliminate yeah. that. So we said, do those, and then go for some of the more, not aspirational, but some of the things that may be a little longer to take effect. Yeah, and, and this is this is a near, to your point as well. This is what CISA means in the administration, the National Cyber Director, when they talk about shaping the ecosystem. Yeah. Right? It is you know how can we drive that culture uh, where it isn't first to market, uh, but it, it is secure to market, uh, and that's that's really you know what we see. What, what we what they're what they're hoping to do here. So and it will yeah. transcend. It should transcend. I think it will. Uh, the the administration. Right, it will carry through, because there's a roadmap here, to your point, Jim. It, it's, it's, you, is this a pushed, right, I like that. Industry maybe pushed back a little bit, we said did. we really can't succeed. They said, okay, but then here's a timeline. So there is a roadmap here, correct? Yeah. So this is, this is 12, 12 months, you know, and, and frankly, there's nothing that says if you've succeeded, and for instance, at Fortinet, we've, some of these, we've, we, we've already, I mean, some of us came into this process knowing this is not only doable, we're doing it. This is the right thing to do. It's good for our company, it's good for our yeah. customers, so we're not coming up with these totally aspirational things. So we knew this was realistic, but this is also envisioned as a serial process. We tried not to boil the ocean and say, we will solve all of cybersecurity with this pledge. We said, let's pick a number of goals. Uh, we, we wanted to have an on-ramp for especially small companies to say, well, okay, after 12 months, I can look and see what have some people done that have succeeded, or even better, what sounded like a good idea, but someone tried it and it didn't work. Because if I'm a small business and I'm interested in the pledge, I probably don't have the resources to try twice. I yeah. need to succeed the first time. So, Dave, to your point, not one and done. It will transcend administrations. The company signed up to do something Regardless, so I think this so is going to have legs. Did that then help the argument that smaller companies might have of you're adding a lot of extra cost and a lot of extra time to our development process, you know, versus somebody like a Fortinet? But now, if you lay it out for them, then there's not a lot of trial and error, right? So hopefully, yeah, and and yeah. you know, you can make the argument that isn't it better to do it right the first time rather than fix problems after something's released? That's what we recognize yeah. at Fortinet that you know it's it's not only the right thing to do, it's actually more efficient to do the process securely from the inside. And then, 
uh, we're, we're addressing vulnerabilities that have been around for a long time. This is simply a way of saying relying on individual customers and small businesses to do these things is just not rational. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, you know, it, by providing that transparency, allowing customers to see who is following yes most closely the framework for secure by design, who is maybe laggy behind, et cetera, they can make informed decisions about their risk appetite, right? Yeah. Not everyone has the same risk profile. And so there should be a place for a di diverse set of players in the market. And there's a little gamification here too because we know the technology industry, the companies who are doing well will market this. Yes. It'll start getting into RFPs. Yes, that's a big, you know, that's a big test. And that, that again, this is sort of self-adjudicating yeah, yeah. mechanism. Because yeah. will, will, will solutions providers, you mentioned earlier, Jim, there's a lack of you know, metric, metrics. Yeah. Will solution providers put, change the way in which they develop or provide products to maybe address that or to support this initiative? I think you will find this getting put into RFPs because people said mm -hmm. this is voluntary, but if this becomes the, the, the expected standard of performance, then why would I not put that in if, to, you know, to, to the point we've been making? If some products in the marketplace meet it and some don't, then yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say this. So it's a non-regulatory solution that allows you to say, I can drive progress. And a lot of these things we look at and go, we have been bemoaning you know, these users failing to do things. This is part of the national strategy of saying, stop blaming the victims, move more of the responsibility to the, to the manufacturers. Just like we changed automotive safety mm -hmm. from the 50s and 60s of saying, all right, you died in an accident, it was solely the motorist's fault. To a whole lot of things were done from designing safer roads and teaching drivers that in school, what moved the needle more than anything else was saying, manufacturers, you're responsible for designing safe vehicles. Starting with seat belts and cars that wouldn't tip over at 25 miles an hour to where we are now with the, the plethora of automation. It's not to absolve the driver of responsibility, but it's to say it's a partnership, not, you know, Good luck, put this all together, maybe it'll run, maybe it'll be secure, that's your problem. Well, the, the transparency piece, however, though, it, it, it does extend beyond the solutions provider, so you know, carrying through the, the example of a, of a driver, you know, if a driver's texting, okay, that's, that's the driver's fault, but if the driver happens to be a large multinational corporation <laughs> <laughs> you know, that left the S3 bucket open is not the fault of the, say the cloud provider, for right. example, that disclosure, that transparency should extend, should transcend just the technology community, should it not? And, yes. and what can be done to, 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 to broaden the, uh, the adoption? of these standards. Well, part, part, part of that will be captured in the incident reporting yep. requirement. That is a regulatory mandate, yep. um, particularly for those critical uh, goods and services that we really depend upon, right? So, so, so the requirement that, you, that, that that end user disclose when they've had a cyber incident and the kind of you know, detail that they have to disclose about that should get at some of that, right? Providing yep. us with more information about uh, you know, what tools are effective, which are not, what are the kinds of things that end users need to be, pay particular attention to doing? Well, you know, one of the topics that comes up here every year, and I don't see, never see a lot of movement in, is um, the request for vendors to be able to share more information between them. And there's a little bit done on the threat intel side, but for the most part, we're still talking about closed walls. And are you hopeful that this initiative actually will stimulate more of that? Well, it certainly will on the vulnerability side yeah. because it, it not only says disclose the vulnerabilities, but make a disclosure of the, the, the common weakness enumeration and the common platform enumeration. Don't just say, I had this, I had this and it fit in this class and here's the taxonomy that is machine shareable. Uh, we were on a panel earlier today and CISA said we have this national vulnerabilities database. We wanted to look at the population by category of vulnerability. The data was so bad that we couldn't because most of the, hmm. most of the reports we had were so, frag so incomplete beyond the here was the CVE, we couldn't even make judgments. So yes, to your point, we start saying, are we doing better at mitigating this memory class or you know, this, this traversal? If you don't have the data, you don't know what's working and what's not working. Yeah. In your view, is the industry doing a good enough job of sharing information. I mean, go back 10 years, uh, there was a, 
at times there were attempts to sort of monetize some of that, that threat intelligence, you know, and I think that has changed, but I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective where we are today in regards to the collaboration across industry and things like threat intelligence. Well, Fortinet, of course, was one of the founders of the Cyber Threat Alliance. Yeah. Uh, and I remember, uh, actually, I think it was a, a, in the context of an RSA meeting, Michael Daniel and I sitting down with the, with the heads of a couple of the founders uh, of CTA, and they were describing this idea they had. They were going to take what had been proprietary, closely held information which was their threat intelligence, and they were actually going to pool it for the common good, and they were instead going to compete on what they could yeah, do yeah. with that threat information. And I remember thinking what a breakthrough that was and how brilliant that was. And CTA has been very successful, I think, uh, in sort of expanding that model. There, there have it, been other attempts to do that. And I think CTA has been the first one that's actually stuck around more than yes. a couple of years, so. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. They, there's a long way to go, but they've yeah. made great progress on that. Uh, and that's what we need to do. Our adversaries are really good at sharing yeah. information. Uh, and, and, and acting as a network, and we need to do the same. But I think your question, the answer is no. Yeah, I, I think there's small pockets of it, but for the most part, it's not, an, it, it's, it's not really an industry best practice to, to share outside of like basic threat intel. Uh, with with your competitors because yeah. it's such a competitive industry, yeah. but, you know. But to, but, you know, but the thing is, it's I I've always said if you do what's best for the customer, everyone wins. Yeah. And I think this industry sometimes forgets that. Yeah. To Zane's yeah. point, the the adversary is exceedingly capable. Yes. So yeah. You, yeah. You, yeah. The industry's got to. And they got no problem sharing info. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So you know. So so saying when I find, getting away from saying I found something that is in fact an exploitable vulnerability, but I'm going to sweep it under the carpet, uh, I'm going to just put it in the, the next upgrade cycle. There are companies that will, will look at, at the features and say I don't need this update because it's not worth the hassle. It, don't hide security problems. The reality is everybody has them and we all live in glass houses so we need to resist the temptation to say look what happened to them because them this week it'll be you next well, week. Well also the consequences of the breaches is so much bigger today than it was even a few years ago. Yeah. You think of just the interconnection of everything in the world, right? Like, you know, your HVAC system gets breached and so your point of sale system that that wasn't the case a decade ago. Right. And so I think the, just the overall stakes and implications and are, are so much greater today. Not to mention yeah. the geopolitical context yes. in which we find ourselves, right? We used to take some comfort in that those adversaries with the greatest capabilities had less at intent yes. uh, than say Iran, North Korea that yeah. had, you know, showed intent to disrupt <laughs> but less capability. Now we have Russia with great uh, incentive yeah. uh, and to, capabilities. to cause and capabilities, and China, w w which you know is is clearly demonstrating their intent to be disruptive. I remember years ago I was interviewing uh, Dr. Robert Gates, former Defense Secretary, and we were having this guy. It was quite some time ago, probably 2016, and and we were talking just about that issue. And I said, Yeah, but doesn't the United States have the best? You know, can't we attack? And he said, You know what? we got the most to lose, so we have to be very careful. And that brings up a really important point around critical infrastructure. And I think this AI wave has really shined a light, to continue the, 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 that, that metaphor, on the exposure to critical infrastructure. And this is why <laughs> initiatives like this, I, I think, are so important, uh, because I, I think on a scale to one, one to 10, in terms of how vulnerable we are, we're closer to a one than we are a 10 as it relates to critical infrastructure, so. And, and I think Suzanne and I are both pretty passionate about this one. It's a very heterogeneous environment. You've got, take even the power sector. Yes, you've got large, well-resourced electrical companies and you've got small rural electrical co-ops where they don't have full-time cyber people. They just, it needs to be plug and play. They are horribly vulnerable and they're on the same grid as the big guys. So it's, it is, it's an uneven vulnerability, it's asymmetric compared to our opponents, and uh, you know we have 16, we have some that we consider more critical than others, but frankly, from my perspective, if you take away power, the power sector, the other 15 and all of society have a bad day as soon as the batteries run out. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, yeah. I, I think to your point on critical infrastructure too, there's a lot of old technology out there that's yeah. deemed critical that uh, I think with some standards in place, you can actually then make an educated decision whether to refresh or upgrade or not, because if it's not at least adhering to the basic levels of, uh, of secure by design, 
then that would at least expose that that's a weakness you know, in the infrastructure. Yeah, it used to be air gapped, we yeah. didn't have to worry about it, yeah. now it's like everything's and connected. Not, you know. well, and, and to build on that point, we've already heard from some in critical infrastructure in the operational technology community that they would like to, secure by design is about product, but when you put it in an operational technology environment, they say we would like to have secure by deployment yeah. principles because I may have really smart field engineers who know how to run a power plant or do wastewater treatment, they don't know cybersecurity, so give me best practices, give me the equivalent seven things I should do when I'm deploying my infrastructure to make them more secure. Yeah, and as we upgrade all of this old technology, right? The electric grid that goes back to the 70s and as we are getting more and more smart, uh, we are getting more and more network dependent, uh, even as we do that. And if we don't build this in a way that is resilient, uh, we are going to be in big trouble. You know, when Russia took down the power in Ukraine in 2015, you remember that? They attacked mm -hmm. yeah. several yep. power plants and to over, over a quarter of a million customers lost power. They got that back on, not because the cyber ninjas got the bad guys out of the network, but because they had guys who knew where the breakers were that had been flipped by, by the remote uh, access, and they got in trucks, they drove out to where the, and they physically put those back in place. We yeah. need to be thinking about analog <laughs> resilience, physical redundancy, all the different ways in which we can operate in a degraded fashion, plan on, do everything you can to keep the bad guys from getting in, then assume they've gotten in, now how are you going to operate? This is so true because the physical and digital worlds are definitely coming together. It used to be physical security was this thing, yeah, we'll just make, put a lot of gates up in front of the data center, and tonight, today, I mean, you could have a drone inside of, you know. And the, the gates I mean, are all remotely controlled. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, if you look at, you look at coming into the Moscone Center, they have the uh, Evolve X-ray systems, right? I mean, just think of how much data's coming off of those on yeah. everything you carry, right? Like, right, well, think about how many <laughs> conferences don't, actually. Yeah. I mean, I go to a lot of conferences. Yeah, yeah. It's still a minority that actually have yeah. metal detectors yeah, that yeah. you walk through when you come in. But the amount of but data they've collected these are, off these of These are connected, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 absolutely. What did it take to get this off the ground? What was the anatomy of this initiative? I mean, it, did, did it, we, when you started to talk about this, we were at a point where we said, wow, this is never going to be able to get done, and how did you get it done? So, you know, we had a, a new national cyber strategy came out last year, and it was largely predicated on the idea that we've had a market failure in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. It's been optional for companies to do, and they pay a literal price for doing it, and others free ride. This whole transparency idea. People in the marketplace want to do, they, they want to make informed decisions, got to get the information to flow. So really, I think it started, it really got kick-started by the national strategy that then led in very short order to CISA, you know, starting with its partners domestically and internationally to come up with Secure by Design, which included radical transparency. Embrace radical transparency within corporations on IT. Heresy, but we've got to start doing it. Yeah. Yeah, Eric Goldstein on our panel this morning talked about the importance of being able to visualize, to envision a better future, right? Um, that, that, that we don't have to live with this level of insecurity in our network system. We don't have to take that as a given. That we can, in fact, strive to, to write code uh, more safely, to create uh, uh, development operations processes that are more secure. Um, there are players who are meeting that standard, who can set best practices and, and create and shape that ecosystem. And then even how your customers respond, right? Yes. Because even that's very inconsistent company to company. So even when you report your CVs, not all companies understand what to do with them or what's affected. Yeah. 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 And increasingly, they're, they're th this, as, as the increasing every year, the increasing size of RSA is testament to how many innovative and creative people there are out there trying to think about how to help companies of all sizes solve these challenges. And an increasing focus, I'm glad to see, on small and medium sized businesses yeah. and how to yeah. help them. Well, I think too, the other thing just the transparency, you, you brought it up at the beginning about media. We're media, so I don't want to, <laughs> you know, to <laughs> media, but, but, but I have seen a number of, of reactions to what are were really benign hacks, uh, yeah. but the media overblows it, but the company was afraid to disclose it, botched the PR, stock price dropped you know, 10, 20% for something that was really not that big of a deal. Yeah. So uh, I think this type of transparency, you know, people will get used to it and say, okay, this is okay, this is not 
a bad company. You know, they're coming clean and they're doing the right thing. And um, I, so I, I really applaud the efforts that you guys are, are making here. As a customer, I'd like to know. Absolutely, you know, I, and I'd like to know immediately. Yeah, yeah. You know, don't, <laughs> don't hide the ball. Um, I'd like each of you to maybe make a final statement um, on where you'd like to see this go, uh, what you hope the outcome will be, and then we can wrap. So even if we look at, uh, on, on Secure by Design, the number of companies, if you collectively look at our market share by segment and overall, if these companies do the things in the pledge, I think a year from now, CISA will be able to say, it's made a difference. I mean, we've some of us have actually challenged CISA to say, you're going to have to be not the scorekeeper, we're not asking them to evaluate what companies say they're doing, but at least collate it, put it in one place so that we, as an industry, we as consumers can look at it and say, what worked, what didn't work. And then we can take those lessons learned and say, okay, pledge version 1.0, or if we knocked most of those off the list as an industry, 2.0. But we set this out to be, to set the bar high enough that if we do this, it will make a difference, and it'll challenge even the big players, and, and, but also not to set it so high that if I'm a small company, I look at this and say, no, that's, it's not, that's not going to happen in this budget cycle. Mm -hmm. So I, I think being able to look a year back and say, yeah, what we did has reduced the prevalence of these bad practices, more companies have signed on to it, we're seeing this transparency in the marketplace, now let's take this to the next step. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and we've talked about the business case for this, right? The competitive advantage, yeah. uh, how we're going to create these market pressures. But I also think it's really important for companies increasingly to take some responsibility for their actions and the impact that it has on their community, on their nation, and on the world. And, and to, if you will, to do the right thing, to be responsible. Uh, and particularly, uh, you know, as I say to my uh, friends in the critical infrastructure industry, you know, CEOs, you do not want to be the company who, result, who, who allows China to put a gun to our head and, and deter us from taking actions that are in our national interest because you have left a vulnerability open or you have, you have not done the things that you could do to make it harder for them uh, and now you're being held at risk. Mm. Uh, so I, I think there's a, there's a sense of, of both personal responsibility and a, and a vested interest here. Yeah. Yes. You know, I, I, Dave, I look at everything through the customer's eyes, right? And uh, uh, the companies are spending more money than ever on, on cyber. They're falling behind. And what, what's frustrating is the lack of transparency. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think um, th this industry, for whatever reason, has pushed off standardization and openness. And I think if you look historically at any industry, transparency and openness creates a rising tide in which everybody wins. And I think in the, we're so scared here to admit we're weak and where, where we made a mistake or where something was wrong that I think vendors have made bad decisions in the past. And I, I think this is one where I implore the vendor industry, be open, be transparent, and do what's best for the customer because that's ultimately going to create winners for everybody, right? That, and that, that's all, that, that should be the ultimate goal for, for this entire show, is to make sure that the customer can do what they need to do. I, I mean, I'll add that I think cyber awareness is everybody's responsibility. Yeah. We, we know that human error is the you know, vast majority of, of the cause of, of cyber breaches. Oh, it's huge. And transparency now puts that responsibility in more hands, and now we can apply good peer pressure to organizations and each other. So guys, thank you so much, Jim, Suzanne, Zias, for participating in this panel. Fantastic initiative and, and great job. Really appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. It's been great talking with you. Okay, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there. We're, we're live from RSAC 2024. We're here in Moscone. Stop by and see us if you're still on the show. You're watching theCUBE.